Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we share with you a few tips on protecting just about any kind of outdoor furniture. Maybe you have a picnic table. Maybe you have a porch swing. Either way, that's out in the elements. It needs protection. We've got some great advice for you there. Yeah, and there are lots of different products for putting on outdoor wood. But if you don't choose the right one, Danny, sometimes it starts blistering off and now you're down to scraping and sanding again. So you you want to avoid that. And we're going to talk to a homeowner who has a concrete driveway and the expansion joints are falling apart and and deteriorating. So what should he do? We give him some tips on how to get out those old joints and put in some new ones. And if you don't do it right, uh, that water and snow and other things can get down under that slab, and that's never a good thing. That's where a lot of settling problems can take take place. And just by little preventative measures, like we're going to recommend, will solve that problem. Hey, did you know that that one window air conditioner is more efficient than another? Well, there's a little code that we're going to tell you about and how you can decide on which one's a little more efficient. Maybe it'll cost just a tad more, but just think how much money you'll save over the years on that one window unit just from the electricity savings alone. And if you're doing some home improvement projects or if you're a DIYer, you know that after a while you start collecting lots of screw driving bits because they come different lengths and different sizes and there are a whole bunch of different types of screws. So how do you store them all neatly and organize them so you can find them when you need them? Well, I've got a simple solution I'm going to share and you don't have to go to the hardware store, but to the fishing aisle of the local department store. And also, I share with you a great idea on a unique video that we're going to try to launch. Um, <laughs> so you say. <laughs> so I think you'll enjoy um, us um, picking on Joe just a little bit. But we have a lot of things that we're going to share with you during this podcast. So let's get started. Let's go to North Carolina right now. Candace right. is on the line. Candace, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hi. We were just talking about um, a little town there that I've been to a number of times, Bryson City there in the in the foothills. Uh, have you been to Bryson City before? No, I have not. But you've heard a lot about it, I'm sure. Mm, not too much. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> lot. What, what, what area of North Carolina do you live in? Eastern North Carolina. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah. I got you. Well, tell us about this porch swing, um, trying to make it last. Tell us about it. So, talking about it last night, I think I've had it for about 14 years now. Mm-hmm. And for the first 10 years, it was on a covered porch. You know, so didn't see a lot of elements. Now that we're in eastern North Carolina, it's hanging outside where it gets a lot of the afternoon sun. Mm-hmm. And I've refinished it before, you know, every third year maybe with um, Minwax, um, the Helmsman, right. Um, right. Uh-huh. polyurethane, mm-hmm. or uh-huh. sparurethane, mm-hmm. excuse me. Right. Mm -hmm. It seems like now I'm having to do it every year. Mm -hmm. Is there something better that I could use? Um, I'm I'm looking at Joe right now on on our our, our Zoom connection, and he's smirking because he knows what I'm about to say. I know where Danny's going, and he has very personal experience. So he's he's the guy to talk to, Candace. (laughs) Okay. um, So I had a beautiful, beautiful front door, a stained door, and um, uh, I tried the very best spar varnish ever, which usually will take care of it pretty well. But when you get a lot of the exposure to the elements, particularly sun, and, and then you have, you know, maybe it gets a little damp in the morning and then it dries out man there's a lot going on uh, to break down a finish when you have those type of elements Um, actually my buddy joe turned me on to something called total boat Um, total boat is something i've used it all over my house here matter of fact i'm going to be using it this afternoon on my outdoor kitchen Um, it is a a a very hardy um, urethane that is made for boats and the really cool thing about it is it um, you act it, it dries fairly quickly, uh, to, so it really locks in everything in a very quick fashion. You can put uh, they say up to five coats on in one day. I, I have put three coats on in one day.
day, and it's amazing how it just encapsulates that wood. It enhances the wood, and so far, it has lasted very, very well on my outdoor wood shutters that I built out of cedar, and also some cedar corbels that I have around the house. I have like 21 of them around the um, the eave of my house. Um, and again, like I said this afternoon, I'm putting two coats on my outdoor kitchen uh, that's built out of uh, pine. So um, I would I would go with that. And uh, you could go to totalboat.com. And uh, the actual product that I use, which has a kind of an unusual name to me for some reason, is Lust. L U S T. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder if that's an acronym. I wonder if that stands for something. We should we should find that out. Maybe, we maybe do, so. Candice, we do recommend this product pretty regularly, so we probably should get a little more information on that. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think I think that's going to um, do what you need it to do, Candice, in getting you multiple years in between having to refinish that um, that port swing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Just be careful when you're ordering Lust online, uh, your your husband. You want to make, explain that completely, what you mean by that. So. I understand. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for being with us, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. All righty. Yeah, and be sure to tell your husband Danny recommended that, not Joe. <laughs> A lot of uh, concrete questions, and here comes another one. Anthony joins us from New Jersey. Uh, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Tell us about this. You're having some uh, um, concerns about your expansion joints in your driveway. Yes. Uh, I live in Washington Township, uh, uh, like a development for 55 and over. Uh, the expansion joints right now, uh, since they built this home uh, about 20 years ago, it's brown material that's in there right now. That's the expansion joint right now. And that's very loose. And my question was, how do you repair that joint? Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, I know exactly what you're talking about. Boy, they use, I guess they still use that in different parts of the country, that black um, expansion material that you laid in there. It seems so primitive nowadays when you think about how concrete is poured. But um, I'll tell you, it's um, it, there is a little bit of work involved here. You would need to, re- what I would suggest, and Joe will get your take on it, is to remove as much of it as you can by right. either either cutting it uh, you know, manually or getting a disc grinder and real carefully cutting it out. And then you're able to um, put a backer rod in there, a rubber backer rod or foam backer rod in there. Okay. And then basically then you're applying um, a caulk to the top of it. I'd use a concrete repair caulk because it'll remain um, flexible for you, Anthony, so that it, you know, with the um, expansion and contraction, with weather and so forth, it won't crack. And then okay. you're basically sealing that up to keep the the water and the snow and so forth from um, penetrating that out. Joe, what, what's your thoughts on that? Because we've been through this before, and I'm sure we you've dealt with it at your own place. Yeah, Anthony, uh, the key is getting it out. And so is this, you know, often it's um, like a half inch thick asphalt, basically. It's like felt asphalt saturated felt and right. it's pretty resilient right so it's hard to cut out but you can use like the most aggressive way would be a cutting wheel on an angle grinder um but you could chip it off it's really in bad shape you only need to remove maybe three quarters of an inch you know down that's and right. then put in the back rod choose a back rod a foam rubber back rod that's at least an eighth inch wider than the joint stuff it in mm-hmm. there make sure it's at least one quarter inch below the surface because you don't want the rubber popping up right and then you're going right. to go over it what right then you're going to go over it with a flexible sealant as danny recommended and what i would suggest is what i've used it works great it's from a company called sika s-i-k-a and it's called Flex SL Sealant. Sika Flex SL. I think it's Sika or Sika. Right, okay. Because that okay. just levels out on itself. Just put in a big old bead, you'll see it'll just level out beautifully on its own. Okay, okay. That'll be, that'll be, uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a good job for me, but, you know. Good. Uh, but uh, like I said, uh, most of it, you got to take it all out. You most likely have to take yes. it all out, and then if it's deep enough, somebody was telling me that uh, you can put some bar sand in there to run it across. Make sure that all the debris is out of there first. Right, that's most important. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's the most important thing is to blow it out. And I'll tell you, a leaf blower does a great job in eliminating all of that. And uh, the product that Joe mentioned sounds like a great solution to it. And good news is you'll only need to do it once. It'll hang in there uh, for you like that. 
You know, we were talking about um, mildicide and M1 yep. additive, which I'm a big believer in because, uh, as I've mentioned several times here on the show, um, my house that I'm moving from right now, um, in 29 years, I only I, I never had to paint it. Little touch up here and there. Wow. I only pressure washed it twice just because I felt like I needed to. But it, um, the mold and mildew that is so prevalent in di- in different areas of the country, particularly in the southeast, I just didn't have that problem. So I'm a big believer in 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 some paint additives. But right. Um. And and we and we also discovered that we had a question about whether the mildicide could be used with stain, and we found out that it could. But you stumbled across something about a paint additive that might repel insects. You told me you would tell us all about that. What 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 is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, that was I was kind of surprised too when I was doing research about M1 is the name of the the brand of the mildicide which comes in a little plastic bottle and you add it. It's only a couple of ounces but you add it to a gallon of paint or as we discovered to stain and to to any kind of wood stain and it and it prevents mildew from forming. Well, while researching that I saw on the company website that they make something called M1 advanced insecticide paint hmm. additive. Hmm. It was introduced about 3 or 4 years ago and you add this to your paint. Now, obviously, this is an exterior paint. I guess you can use it inside, but it's designed for exterior paint. And if any sort of bug lands on this paint, they told me the bug will eventually die. Not immediately. It won't come falling off wow. the. It won't fall off the paint film like onto the ground. <laughs> but I guess there's something in this paint, and it lasts at least two years, sometimes three or four years. I guess depending on what part of the country you live, whether it's exposed to a lot of sun and rain or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought that was fascinating, yeah, and I didn't know that was an issue. I mean, yeah, is that an issue with bugs? I guess in some parts of the country, I live in the northeast. Dan lives in the southeast, so he has much longer summers. You might have more of a bug problem. I'm not sure. But I just mm-hmm. thought that was really interesting. So if, if you have an issue with a lot of bugs, it, even if it's only on one side of your house, maybe just do the end of your house where you're seeing a lot of bugs because maybe the bugs attract other things which you don't want on your house. Right, yeah. Um, so, again, it's called M1 Advanced Insecticide Paint Additive. How about that? Yeah, and, and, you know, there's uh, other paint additives that we've talked about. Um, one is uh, Floetrol, which I've used a lot. That's right, and yep. Basically, when you're really trying to eliminate those brush strokes, let's say particularly on um, something like furniture or painting cabinets, uh, first of all, the first step is buy a really good brush that's designed for the type of that's work right. you're doing. But then the Floetrol is one that you can just add just a little bit to your uh, latex paint. And, boy, it makes that paint just really lay down. The professionals have been using that for a long, long time. Yeah, especially in spraying. That's where I think – that's the first, first time I heard of it. Um, the pros typically spray paint, and when you spray, you want it to even out. And that's what it does. It just I think the word flow troll, the, the company name, comes from flow control. It's allowing you to control the flow of the paint, and you want that paint just to float out. Because especially these days with latex paint, it's so thick. I, I stirred up a new gallon the other day. I thought it was cock. It was so thick. I thought, <laughs> how could they ever spray this? You know, But they thin it out and spray it. But the idea is you put this flow troll in it, and it, as Danny said, it works for brushing as well and you and if you brush it out with the flow trawl in it and it just the paint just sort of floats out and evens out and you do eliminate almost all of those brush strokes have you ever used anything called japan dry have you ever heard japan of that? Japan dry. I've heard of Japan paints, and I'm not really yeah. sure what that is, to tell you the truth. I thought it was, well, thought it was artistic I, th- I think paints. the J- Japan dry is something to speed up the hardening of the paint. Oh. And it's just sometimes I have I haven't heard about it for years and years and years, but um, something like that. But anyway, a lot of different ways that you can add additives to paint. Read the instructions, but different ways, the different little tips that the pros use to make the paint um, really perform a lot better. Eight hundred nine four six. 4420 is the Today's Homeowner Hotline. A lot of times when people call on the hotline, they they leave us a recorded question. We're not able to get back with them other than right now through the radio. And we're going to grab a few of those right now, starting off with Bob in New York. I have an electric hot water heater that has a magnesium chloride rod in it. I think it's chloride. And I have a sulfur smell in the hot water. Can I drain the tank? And what type of rod should I put in it to get rid of the smell? Or do I just get rid of the tank and buy a new one and put the right zinc rod in? 
well, let's don't get rid of that uh, water heater quite yet, uh, but I definitely would drain that water heater, and that's something we encourage you really do at least once a year, and it's very, very easy. All of the instructions that you need is right at todayshomeowner.com. We've covered this pretty thoroughly, but uh, of course, drain it out, then flush it. Adds, you know, Turn that water back on a little bit, flush everything out of there that you possibly can. A lot of times, that's all you really need to improve the smell of the hot water, but a lot of times, there's a lot of, there's things going on in there. The reactions between the magnesium and uh, also if you have any kind of water softener that can react to it as well. But since the magnesium rod um, that you have now, go ahead and replace it with either a zinc rod or an aluminum rod. And that way, whatever reaction is taking place in there to create that um, the rotten egg smell, you'll be able to eliminate. So drain that tank well, flush it well, and then replace with either zinc or aluminum and give that a try, Bob, and see if that doesn't uh, solve the problem. I'm sure it will. Right now, we'll go to Minnesota with Mary. I have a composite kitchen floor that's finished to look like wood. The one problem I have with it is that uh, my kitchen chairs came with caps on their legs uh, to protect the floor from scratching. But the problem is that the caps have scuffed the floor. Uh, I've been washing the floor with different soaps and vinegar to bring up to bring the color back, but it hasn't worked. What can I do to remove the scuff marks and bring back the color? Okay, Mary, you said you have a composite kitchen floor, and to tell you the truth, I'm not sure exactly what that is. I don't know if it's a vinyl floor or it could be a laminate floor. Uh, maybe it's vinyl, but either way, um, what I would try first, Obviously, you're going to have to put new um, glides, they're called, on the bottom of those chairs because otherwise this problem is going to continue. Um, the felt, they have like compressed felt glides that work really well. But in any case, as far as these stains, I would first try a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. I don't know if you've ever seen these. They look like little white sponges almost. You just put, typically soak them in water and... And I'm not really sure how they work or what they're made out of, but it's amazing when nothing else works, these seem to work. Um, test it in an incons inconspicuous spot first on the floor just to make sure it's not taking any kind of sheen off. Um, and if that doesn't work, um, you can also try spraying it with some WD-40. Wait a couple of minutes, then buff it with a soft cloth and see if that doesn't remove it. Okay, let's go to Kentucky and see if we can help out Steve. I would like to know how to uh, cut the bottom off of a ball jar like you had, I don't know, last year sometime where the guy made some lights on a ball jar. And how did he cut the bottom off? Yeah, that was pretty cool how, how that's done, and a lot of people use um, the jars like that, the old mason jars for a lot of different things. Well, you can take a piece of tape and tape it around exactly where you want to cut, and then use a glass cutter, just that, that real simple uh, manual glass cutter to go around, and all you're trying to do is score the glass. You're not trying to actually cut it through, but make a nice, even score all the way around the glass, then um, go to, go, go to um, your sink and pour boiling water over it real slowly as you're rotating it around. Get it nice and heated up, then add cold water to it. Then you might have to do it a few times, but that expansion and contraction will separate right where you've scored it, and you'll have a nice clean cut. You still got to be careful though, because there's a big opportunity here for for you still to um, you know have a cut here and there. But um, that certain that certainly should do it, and we we've seen it before. And a lot of times after you've done that, not a bad idea to take a little bit of sandpaper and sand around there to make it a little safer. Time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot, how doers get more done. You know, in recent years, front-loading washers have been the most popular option, but a lot of people still prefer the top-loading models. So Samsung has delivered a great one. Their new high-efficiency top-load washer has a 5.4 cubic feet capacity, so it helps you fit more into every load and cuts down on laundry time with its super speed technology. You can wash a full load of laundry laundry in just 36 minutes without sacrificing cleaning performance. It also allows steam cleaning, which provides powerful stain remover while still being very gentle on your clothing. And the active water jet features lets you easily pre-treat stained clothes. Plus, the soft closed lid closes smoothly, safely, and quietly to keep a little peace around the home. Now, for more information on this very special Samsung high-efficiency top-loading washing machine, log on to Home Depot. 
Com. You know, Joe, when you go to the like kitchen and bath shows and some of these trade shows like that, um, it always amazes me how they're trying to make that they're, they're taking those washing machines and dryers and, you know, they've, you know, every home needs them. And boy, they're, right. they're doing everything there. They've got, you know, of course, you've got an app for that now that you can do things right. with. And then you have the drawers, the little storage containers under it where you, you know, actually position the washer and dryer on top. Of yeah, the big pedestal bases drawer. You know, you got yeah. that, which kind of makes sense. So it's just when you when you go out to buy a washer and dryer, you may think you're just going to run in and get one, but you'll be amazed at all the different things that are available out there. Here's another email. Debbie asked, the rubber backing from my throw rugs in my bathroom stuck to the ceramic tile floor. How can I remove it? That's a um, rubber backing in a, in a, a bathroom like that is very important because you can slip and fall very easily. But um, what about, um, what would be the safest thing on that, Joe? When you're talking about ceramic, man, you can use almost anything on ceramic versus other surfaces and exactly, everything. Yeah. But what would you suggest that Debbie start with first? Just uh, um, may, maybe some of the goo gone or something along yeah, those lines? Yeah, yeah. Well, first you want to use a putty knife, and I would recommend a plastic putty knife because you don't want to scratch up anything, uh, just to remove as much of the rubber backing as possible because that'll make it easier because you're really what you're trying to remove is whatever stuck to the tile, not just sticking up above the tile. So scrape off what you can. And you could, um, we mentioned this earlier, um, you can spray WD-40 on it, and that is, Dis- will dissolve it now i will caution you though try not to get the wd-40 on the grout joints um because you don't want to stain the grout joint so you have to be careful of that um but yeah there's goo gone there's goof off right danny because there's two mm-hmm. different companies yeah, with two different right. names um and you want to use a nylon scrubber like a nylon not anything with uh no metal no stainless steel or even or, or steel wool nothing with soap in it so just a nylon scrubber and that would you know spray it wait a few seconds and then scrub it off and again test it in a small spot to make sure it works but that's probably the best thing you do you can also try hot water just to dissolve it but that's of course a little messier because you're pouring hot water all over the floor but one of those techniques should work yeah there you go should be able to get that nice and clean here's another email from rosemary in savannah georgia what is the best product to clean the outside of my gutters they're aluminum gutters and i've tried bleach and that didn't do it we're going to have the house um, um, painted and i don't want dirty gutters sitting on a freshly painted house thank you for your help <laughs> you, you know um that's a very interesting joe and i'm and i'm really not sure of the solution on some of these issues with uh baked aluminum gutters now you take a right. baked paint on a gutter like that that you know you really would expect to be able to have a very good scrubbable surface but it seems like after a few years these things get streaked and aged such that you can't get that um, dirt or whatever that is on the outside of it and I've seen many people very frustrated just like Rosemary is talking about a freshly painted house and you've got these gutters that are just bringing the look of the house down Uh, Uh, certainly you can repaint the gutters but have you found anything that will truly at least um, get those gutters clean. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, you can always spray them with a with a pressure washer if you own one. My only concern is spraying anything up out of roof right you know mm-hmm. if you, you have to be so careful because you know shingles only work in one direction if you start spraying water up a roof it, you know you, there's a chance it could get under and leak through the plywood seams and drip into the house so if you can get to them if they're on if it's on the first floor um rosemary doesn't mention i don't believe but if it's on the first a uh, single level house maybe you can reach it with a ladder and all you need is water and white vinegar wipe it down that usually will do the trick if you get any stains mix a paste of cream of tartar and and water and scrub that off because you don't want to corrode either the aluminum or the finish on the aluminum and there's also a product called uh 30 seconds uh outdoor cleaning concentrate or something like that and you mix it one to one water to this concentrate and and that works really well that 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 would clean pretty much anything outdoors it's pretty it's a pretty interesting product but i would i would try you know just a white vinegar because it's not anything that's really difficult to get off it's just like you said it builds up over time sometimes it's a little mildewy um and it's it's surprising that that painted aluminum surface gets a little bit of a texture to it as it sits out in the sun right. i think mm-hmm. that you know it's not as smooth as it might look when it's brand new and that little pitted surface will attract dust dirt mildew and that kind of thing sure. but it usually comes off pretty easily 
Yeah, and boy, I'll tell you, if you have a lot of guttering, it is quite the project to try to paint it. You know, you can't oh, paint yes. it successfully, but boy, you have to, you know, you almost have to um, uh, spray it. When you spray it, you got to cover up everything. Everything, and boy, yeah. oh boy, after a while, you want to take a hammer and just start hacking away at it. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. just, just And you know what, terrible. if you're going to take it down the paint, you might as well just get new gutters. Right, exactly, exactly. Here's another email from Patty in North Carolina. Um, Hi, guys. I love listening to your show. The wood siding on my home is dirty and starting to turn green. What's the best cleanser to use to wash my siding? I do not have a pressure washer, uh, but do I need to buy one? Thank you very much. Um, Well, you know, the... Of course, we recommend uh, um, the products from Wet and Forget quite a bit, and yep. they do work. You have to be have to be patient. But um, Patty, I think that's what I that's what I would do. Go to wetandforget.com, and you'll be able to see how their system works. It's very inexpensive. It's very do it yourself friendly. And take it from me and Chelsea, everybody that I know that's used it is very effective. And you don't have to do any scrubbing. You basically just spray it on there. I think that's a uh, probably the way that i would suggest doing it um yeah and they have that hose and applicator oh yeah so you basically just screw this jug i think it's it's a 48 ounce jug and it covers about 2,000 square feet that's right i think if i remember correctly and just plug it onto your hose and spray we actually use that on my house that I'm selling right now because I wanted to make sure you know we, we pressure washed everything it's clean as a whistle it's just beautiful looking but of course, it won't stay that way with brick being porous, driveways That's being right. porous. So we came right back after all of it's nice and clean and uh, sprayed the entire outside of the surface, including the driveway, sidewalks, everything wow. with wet and forget hose in. And you know, you, you've seen my, my other house and it's, it's sure. fairly high. And uh, we were able to not even break out the ladder and shoot wow. all of those high wow, eaves and great. so forth with that. Yeah. So it, uh, it worked out very, very well. So It's like so many things that we mention here. It's products that we use, and we know that it works very, very well. Let's grab another email here. This was from South Carolina. Scott writes in, My wife and I are renovating a mid-50s home, and we've hit a little snag with repairing the front porch. The concrete steps have some chunks and chips missing, and I know that the repairs aren't really deep enough to put regular concrete on there, but I'm just not sure what else would work. Well, Scott, that is an extremely common scenario, and and you're right. You know, regular concrete, you just can't put some concrete on a thin veneer like this. And uh, again, it's a very, very co- common problem. But, uh, w- but, but Joe, you know, when you're working on something like this, uh, especially if it might be on a vertical surface and so forth, uh, right. it can be a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, most people I don't not sure are aware there's lots of different types of concrete. Even if you go into home center, you might see six or seven types, but there are probably all twenty different types. Go to quickcrete.com and you'll see. It's amazing how many products. And especially for steps, because steps have vertical surfaces and horizontal surfaces, right? So especially for the vertical surfaces, regular concrete doesn't set up quickly enough and it has a tendency to slump down a little bit. So yeah, you do have to be careful to pick the right pro- the right product for the right project. Yeah, you know what I used recently here, and it was kind of cool because it came in a 20-pound bucket. And I thought, well, okay. that's not going to go very far. But, man, that was so convenient to use that. And it was actually what they call the Polymer Modified Structural Repair. Again, it's Polymer Modified Structural Repair. And uh, it, it set up really, really fast. It's a real high-strength repair material that's really designed for vertical or horizontal surfaces like that when any kind of concrete repair you do. And it makes it perfect for step repair because you can kind of sculpt it to match the contour of the existing surface. And That's right. Since yep. it, yeah, it you know it sets up real quickly, so you don't have to build you know all these forms and all of that kind of thing so uh so scott that's what i would recommend uh, go to quickrete.com and you'll see and you can read all of the specs and how to use that uh and they have so many great videos on there i'm sure you could find a video of the polymer uh, modified structural repair and uh, again that's quickrete.com so i think it'll take care of it one one tip danny about anytime you're putting new concrete on wet concrete read the directions directions so they almost always recommend two really important prep steps one is to brush out any loose debris of course but also mist it with water because if you set wet new concrete against old concrete what happens is the old concrete sucks the moisture out of the new concrete and it cures too quickly and it doesn't bond as well and sometimes it will crack so that's a very simple but key step mist it with water before putting on the new concrete Go over to todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions and uh, check out over 500 simple solutions that Joe's put together over the last 20 plus years. And he's got one for you right now. 
All right, Danny, here's one. A friend of mine actually called me recently with a with a question about his shed. And I thought he had a storage shed built out back. <clears throat> and I thought I'd share it because it's, it's, a, it's a really good tip. And he was concerned because the ground right outside the door of the shed was getting all worn out and sunken. And, of course, the grass got worn away. And now when it rains, it's just a soggy, muddy mess. So he thought, okay, well, what can I do there? And he was calling me about maybe building some kind of deck or a step or something. So I told him, here's the easiest way is you make a simple landing pad, what I call a landing pad, out of, and all you need are a few two by fours and some gravel. So what you do is build a two by four frame, a rectangular frame out of the two by fours, and you want to make it, you know, at least two or three feet wide and as long as the doorway, maybe a little longer than the doorway. You want to cover a little extra ground and set it on the ground and dig around, use a shovel to dig around the perimeter of this frame, then move the frame out of the way and dig out within that little cut line you made, dig out at least three inches of dirt. And then you set the frame back in so it settles down. You only have maybe a half inch or so sticking up because it's two by fours or three and a half inches. So you dig down about three inches, set it in, line the bottom of the hole with some landscape fabric just to keep weeds from growing through it, fill it with gravel, compact the gravel, and that's it. And as the gravel settles down, you can always add more if you need to, but that's all you need to do because rain will run through it. The two by fours, use pressure treated two by fours, they'll last virtually forever. Nothing's really fastened down, you know, so if you need to move it or make it larger or smaller, you can. Um, but that's it. So you just need some two by fours and some gravel and make yourself a landing pad. Hey, now it's time for our podcast question of the week. You can send us one anytime at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. This comes from Evelyn in Michigan. How can I keep the squirrels off of my bird feeders? I usually leave a little seed under the feeders for the squirrels, chipmunks, and larger birds, but the squirrels still are relentless trying to get into my bird feeders. Well, uh, Joe, I, the, you know, how many videos have you seen where people have videotaped right. uh, of squirrels uh, trying to, you know, to, you know, I've heard people, uh, of course, it depends on this particular type of feeder, but I'm I'm envisioning one like I have in my yard that has the the thin metal rod that comes up and arches over right. and basically holds oh, right. the, the yeah. bird feeder. Yeah. And of course, um, you think, okay, it's metal. The squirrels aren't going to be able to get up there, but those those rascals can get up just about anything. That's right. But uh, I know, you know, a while back you were telling me that uh, uh, when you were younger that you actually went out with some Vaseline. And <laughs> right, grease the yeah. pole um, uh, how, <laughs> at my how, mom's house. How, yeah. did, how did that work out? Well, my parents had uh, about a three-inch diameter painted metal pole, and the bird feeder was sitting on top of that. And we thought, oh, the squirrels, they can't dig their claws into it, but they have little pads, and I guess those little pads is all they need. And they ran up it like it wasn't even there. And so um, I thought I would just grease it up with some Vaseline. Mm -hmm. And the squirrels looked very confused because they had been running <laughs> up and down it for a few days. Then suddenly they ran up it and slid down then ran up it and slid and then you sat on the ground and stared up at it quite confused <laughs> but after a while the vaseline wore away the rain got to it so it wasn't a very effective i must say it was pretty entertaining but not very effective um but yeah like you said there are squirrel proof bird feeders you could certainly buy um some of them have a wire baffle that goes around the outside that the squirrels just can't get through and the birds can kind of hop through it um and a lot of them have little slide down doors that cover the feed so a bird's not heavy enough to close the door but a squirrel sits on the perch and this little door comes down and when they hop off the door goes back up so th those are, they're pretty expensive that's the only downside mm -hmm. um, but i would not recommend sprinkling seed under the feeder because you're just attracting right them. of course yeah and sooner or later you're gonna have more squirrels than you have feed and they're gonna look up or, and start or eating even that. worse you know mice and rats and things like that right that's just, exactly yeah um there is a pepper-based repellent um, called from a company called Critter Ritter, and it's just a spray, and you can spray it around, and I guess any kind of critter gets near mm -hmm. it. Um, they don't like it because it has pepper in it, like pepper spray, I guess. And you have to be careful where you hang it. I mean, you don't want it like hanging next to a tree where they can jump on it. I had one for many years hanging from a tree, but it was out maybe 10 feet from the tree, and it was from a company called Droll Yankee, D-R-O-L-L -L Yankee, and the model I had was called the Big Top, and it had this large plastic dome that covered the huh. seed tray, and so when the squirrels would slide down the wire or hop from a nearby branch, they'd hit this dome and just fall off, and that worked huh. for many years until a bear got a hold of it and tore it apart, so I have to get a new one, but um, that that works pretty well. You know, any, Anything that deters, you can get bird feeders that do deter squirrels. She just has to find the right one. 
Well, I have seen a few videos where people have built some squirrel catapults. I've seen that. I didn't know squirrels could fly like that. They walk it up like that. You see this surprise look on the squirrel <laughs> exactly. that's just flying across, you know, and, and I'm sure it doesn't hurt them, but uh, they're like, what just happened, you right. know? But but I, I think I might just slip out to the shop there and grab me a can of silicone spray. Okay. And um, I think I'll, I'll I'll get out and spray that down and, um, and, and watch the squirrels. That'd be a nice, relaxing thing to do this right, afternoon. Right, exactly. <laughs> hey, you can send us your question anytime by going to today's homeowner.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for uh, being with us each and every week here. And I wanted to mention that um, just last month, over 50,000 people downloaded our podcast. That's our highest number yet. And it keeps going up and we really appreciate it. And um, part of that is because of the great reviews we're receiving. And certainly a special thanks to all of those five-star reviews we got last week. We read each and every one of them and we really are humble by everybody taking the time to listen to our show, listen to our podcast, and take the time to write us a review. We really appreciate it, and we're here for you again. Today's homeowner.com slash podcast. I'm Danny Lippert, along with my buddy Joe Truini. Thank you again for listening to this Today's Homeowner Podcast.